This is the second video for section 2.2 on the number of candidates matters. In this lecture, we'll be talking about something called May's theorem. The general topic of this lecture, though, is to figure out how do we find the winner of an election between two candidates. It turns out that there's many different methods that we can use. And what we're going to do in this lecture is look at some different examples of those methods and analyze each method using properties that indicate fairness. And an election method that has these properties is going to be considered fair. When there's only two candidates, things are relatively simple. We talked about preference lists in the previous lecture, but when there's only two candidates, there's only two possible preference lists. Either you like A more than B and you vote for A, or you like B more than A and you vote for B. The candidate with the most votes wins, and this method is called majority rule. So that's the most common method that you are probably already pretty familiar with for two candidates. And we call it majority rule because it really is a guarantee that one of the two candidates is going to get a majority as long as there's not an exact tie. If one of the candidates gets more than half the votes, a majority, the other candidate has to get less than half. Remember that more than half the votes is what we mean when we say the word majority. It just means more than half. And so as we're going to see, majority rule has three what we call fairness properties. It's anonymous, neutral, and monotone. So these are vocabulary words that I'm about to define for you, but these are going to be criteria that we're going to use to measure lots of different voting methods. So let's start with anonymous. We say that a voting method for two candidates is anonymous if it has this property. And the property is that whenever two voters in the election exchange their filled out ballots, their completed ballots, before submitting them, the outcome of the election doesn't change. So envision you've got two people walking up to the voting booth, and right before they put them in the ballot box, they swap papers, they don't change what's written on the paper, and then they put them in the box. So in this way, anonymous means that who is casting the vote doesn't impact the result of the vote. All of the voters are treated equally. So my vote isn't worth any more or any less than your vote, regardless of who we vote for. So the next property is neutral. We say that a voting method for two candidates is neutral if it has the property that if we redo the election, a new election were held, and every voter reverses their vote. So if I voted for A the first time around, now I'm going to vote for B. If I voted for B the first time around, now I'm going to vote for A. So every single person switches their vote. Then that should also reverse the result of the election. And so the idea, and again, that should seem like an intuitive thing that should always happen for an election. If everybody changes their vote to the other candidate, then the other candidate, who whichever candidate won the first time, the other candidate should win the second time. So in this way, one candidate isn't being given any preference over another. The two candidates are being treated equally. So anonymous meant that the voters were being treated equally. Neutral means that the candidates are being treated equally. Monotone is a little bit harder to understand, but it again, it's an intuitive sort of fairness idea. So a voting method is monotone if it has this property. So we have a new election, and the only thing that changes is that one or more voters change their vote from a vote for the original loser to a vote for the original winner. So then the new election should have the same outcome as the first election. So again, the idea is that we sort of think about redoing the election and changing something. A lot of these properties have that idea. So let's say in election one, uh, let's say A wins. And then in election two, the only thing that's going to change is that some people who voted for B, the loser, right? So A wins, B loses. So some people who voted for B now vote for A. That's the only thing that changes. And so if we do that, what monotone would say is that A should still win, right? So A got even more votes than they got the first time, so A should still be the winner. That's the idea. So here are our three fairness criteria for two candidates that we're going to use. And again, hopefully as I've explained them, these seem like sort of natural good properties that any election method should have. But the majority rule is not the only method. So we can think of other methods for finding the winner of an election. Here are just a few examples. There are lots and lots of examples. So we could decide that the method we use is patriarchy. Only the votes of men count. Or maybe the method we use is dictatorship. There's a certain voter that we call the dictator, and only the dictator's vote counts, and the, all the other ballots are ignored. Or we have, similar to dictatorship, we have what we call an oligarchy, where there's a small council of voters, and only their votes count. Or we have what we call imposed rule, which is a certain candidate wins no matter what the votes are. We take all the votes, we dump them in the trash, and we decide, you know, A wins or B wins, right? So uh, the, the outcome is predetermined. 
Hopefully all of those methods that I described to you don't seem like fair methods for finding the, me the winner of uh, an election with two candidates. But that idea of fairness is subjective. So our goal here is to find some kind of objective, sort of cold mathematical way of thinking about fairness that doesn't rely on our intuition, that doesn't rely on our emotions, that we can analyze these methods and understand exactly precisely why they are unfair. So let's look at some examples. So let's say we have an election between two candidates, A and B, and we've got five voters, which I'll call Ursula, Wally, Xander, Yolanda, and Zelda. And Ursula and Walda prefer candidate A, Xander, Yolanda, and Zelda prefer candidate B. So for using majority rule, Xander, Yolanda, and Zelda prefer B, and Ursula and Wally prefer A, B gets three votes, A gets two votes, so B wins three to two. But let's change the rules. Let's think about a different system. So let's suppose we're using a matriarchy system where only the votes of women count. So in our example, Ursula, Yolanda, and Zelda are women, Wally and Xander are men, and so in our example, Wally and Xander's votes are ignored. Ursula votes for A, Yolanda and Zelda vote for B. So B still wins, but the score is two to one because B got two votes and A got one vote. So is this system anonymous? Let's just focus on that first fairness criteria. So remember, anonymous means whenever two voters exchange their completed ballots before submitting them, the outcome of the election doesn't change. So if you look at this election, take a second, do you see a way that two of these voters could trade their ballots before they submit them and change the result of the election? Well, what you might notice is that if one of the men exchanges a ballot with one of the women, then the election can have a different result. So let's say, for example, that Wally and Yolanda trade ballots. So now Wally, even though Wally prefers A, he traded his ballot with Yolanda, so now Wally votes for B. And Yolanda traded her ballot with Wally, so Yolanda now votes for A. And so now A gets two votes. A gets Ursula and Yolanda's vote, and B only gets Zelda's vote. Wally votes for B now, but nobody cares about Wally's vote because Wally's a man, so in this system, Wally's vote is discarded, and so A now wins two to one. And so this system is not anonymous because we found a way where two voters exchanged completed ballots, but the, va the result of the election did change. So this example shows that this voting system does not have that anonymous property. Let's try a different system. So let's say we have a point system. And in this point system, votes for A are worth two points and votes for B are only worth one point. So remember, we have the same voters, the same preferences, so this time, since Ursula and Wally prefer A, that's two votes for A, two times two is four points. And we've got three voters who prefer B, but those votes are only worth one point. Three times one is one, so that's only three points for B. So A wins four points to three points. Is this voting system neutral? Okay. So again, we look at this system and we say, okay, this is unfair, right? And it doesn't make sense for A's votes to be worth two points and B's votes will only be worth one point. But again, we wanna to try to analyze it using our system. So we wanna know if this thing is neutral. So neutral means, remember, every voter switches their ballot to the other candidate and we want the winner of the election to also switch. So let's see if we do that. So if every, every voter is switching their ballot, now instead of Ursula and Wally voting for B, no, sorry, voting for A, they vote for B. And instead of Xander, Yolanda, and Zelda voting for B, now they vote for A. So what's the score this time? Well, now B gets two votes. So B gets two times one, which is two points. A has three voters voting for them now. So that's three times two, which is six points which means A still wins, actually even wins by more than they won before. So this example shows that this point system that we've been talking about is not neutral. Every voter reversed their vote, right? So we did that, every voter reversed their vote, but the outcome of the election was not reversed. So what was supposed to happen for neutrality for this neutral property didn't actually happen. Let's try one more example. So this time we're gonna talk about minority rule the candidate with the fewest votes wins. And again, that might seem like sort of a crazy system to you, but you could imagine a reality show where you're voting for the person that you want to vote off the island, and so you want to get the fewest votes. You, you win in that sense, 
by getting the fewest votes. So it's not totally crazy. So again, we're looking at the original election. A has two votes, B has three votes, so A wins two to three, right? Remember in this system, the smallest number of votes, the lowest number of votes is the winner. Okay, so is this system monotone? So monotone means if we have a new election and the only thing that changed was that one or more voters change their votes from a vote for the original loser to a vote for the original winner, then the new election should have the same outcome. Okay, so let's walk through this. We already figured out that in this original election, which I'm gonna call election number one here, as we said on the previous slide, A wins two to three. Remember, minority rule here means the lowest number of votes wins. Okay, so we're gonna have a new election and we're not gonna change much. Most of this is gonna stay the same, but what's gonna change is that one or more people who voted for the loser is now gonna vote for the winner. B was the loser. So we're gonna say one or more people who voted for the loser, which in this example is B, now vote for the previous winner, who was A. So somebody changes their vote from B to A. Let's pick somebody. Let's say Zelda. So Zelda is going to now vote for A. But that's going to change the result of the election because now A has three votes. B has two votes, right? Zelda isn't voting for B anymore. So B has two votes. And now that means that B wins in this crazy minority rule system because B has the fewest votes. So what did we do? So we changed it so that one or more voters change their vote from a vote for the original loser to a vote for the original winner. So we did that, but the new election should have had the same outcome, but it didn't. It didn't have the same outcome. So this example shows that this system doesn't have the monotone property. Okay, so let's think about what we're doing with these examples. These fairness criteria that we've been using talk about things that have to happen every time. If you do blah, then blah has to happen, right? And if you read all those properties, they all are worded that way. If such and such happens, then this is what should happen to the outcome of the election. So an example where the criteria doesn't happen is gonna show that that election is unfair in that sense. So one example where the thing that's supposed to happen doesn't happen is enough to show that the election doesn't satisfy that fairness property. But unfortunately, there's no easy way to do it the other way around. To try to show that an election method does satisfy a particular criteria, that would mean that we would have to show that the thing that's supposed to happen always happens, no matter what. And that's a lot harder. That's a bigger you know, hill to climb in that sense. And that's going to require some kind of logical argument or mathematical proof. And that's a much uh, harder problem. So if you're in that kind of situation, what you want to do is try to explain why the thing that always is supposed to happen always does happen. So writing a couple of sentences, explaining your reasoning, explaining your thought process, that's the idea. But if you want to show that a fairness criteria doesn't work, then all you have to do is cook up an example that shows it. So all of the different methods that we looked at, other than majority rule, didn't satisfy all of the fairness criteria that we looked at. And it turns out that that's not just a coincidence. It turns out that it's been proven by Kenneth May in 1952 that majority rule is the only system with two candidates that satisfies all three of the fairness criteria. Some of these other systems might have two out of three or one out of three, but the only one that hits three out of three is majority rule. So no matter what creative system we could come up with for two candidates, it's gonna fail at least one of those three conditions. So as we look ahead, May's theorem gives us a way to sort of say, look, when you have two candidates, majority rule is the best. It's the, got all the fairness criteria, hands down, it's the only thing you can do. But the situation is gonna get significantly more complicated when we have more than two candidates. But we're still gonna try to look at those systems of those different ways to find the winner of that kind of election using fairness criteria. So we're going to take a lot of the ideas from this lecture and carry them forward to having more than two candidates.